Hi folks, Editing Sara here. Just a couple quick notes. First off, Muppet Sex and Trauma is going to be taking a, a little bit of a break uh, for the next six weeks. I just have too much on my plate with the end of the semester, so we'll keep recording and um, we'll release those episodes when I've had uh, time to edit. And uh, the second note is about this episode, which does contain a discussion of uh, violations of consent within a sexual context. Um, just thought some of you would want a heads up on that. So I hope you enjoy the episode, and uh, after that we'll see you again in a few weeks. Yeah, I've got like two strands in the middle of my beard that are gray. They were red, now they're gray. I have quite a lot of gray, although you can't really see it on mm. the screen. Um, but the annoying one is the white hairs that get in my eyebrows. Ah. Like, why? And I'm just over here turning 25 in a month. <laughs> Flip your hair. Get out. Me. Get that's it. No, you're not you're, you're not welcome on this episode. <laughs> and speaking of queer people murdering people. <laughs> well that escalated quickly. <laughs> How dare you talk about love not like that? I went from zero to a hundred. Holy shit. <laughs> like this episode. Yes. Right? Hi, friends. Hello, puppets. Howdy, y'all. And welcome to Muppet Sex and Trauma. I'm Sarah Ezat, maker of the Costume Codex videos. I'm Jack Cram, e editor slash right-hand man for Passion of, of the Nerd and editor for Chipperish Media. My name is Josh Gosden, and I'm blue, double D, double die, double D, double die, double D, double die. And today we're joined by Ren. How's it hanging, y'all? Hey, Hi. and uh, we are going to be talking about the episode uh, 113, Rhapsody in Blue. Da -ba -dee -ba -dee -da -dee. We have to do it every time. Every time. <laughs> Rhapsody in Blue was written by Ro Hume and David Kemper. We've seen Hume write before with Exodus from Genesis, and David Kemper is the showrunner, but this is his first time writing. Being directed by Andrew Prowse, who previously directed Premiere and DNA Mad Scientist. Yo, listen up, here's the story. The episode opens on a dream of Crichton's, a memory of a lost love. Alex, the girl who got away. She is telling him she's moving across the country for work, and he is absorbing the information. And then he puts away the engagement ring that he obviously planned to give her. And then he's jolted awake. Something is up with Moya. She thought she heard the distress cry of another pregnant leviathan and was attempting to locate the source. Everyone else was jolted awake too. And as they compare notes, it seems they were all having the same sort of dream. Or at least the men were. The, the girls aren't saying. Moya finds the source of the signal, but it's not a pregnant leviathan. It's a planet with familiar looking inhabitants. It seems this is an outpost of expat Delvians on a mission. The leader, Talleen, explains that they fooled Moya to bring Zahn here. And Zahn is, uh, looking suspicious. Not only did they manipulate Moya, but it seems they were responsible for everyone's dreams. And for Zahn, it went beyond just bringing back a memory. Because you invaded my soul last night and you left me bitter. Aaron and John accompany Zahn to the planet to stock up on supplies, though Aaron gets booted as soon as she starts poking around. Aline takes advantage of their presence to show off her skills to Zahn. She can enter people's minds at will and change their memories. While on the planet, we also meet Talene's father, Tuzak, the founder of the Order, who now has a rather tenuous grip on reality. I am insane. And he tells Crichton he thinks Zahn might be in danger. And we meet two of her acolytes, Lorana and Hasco. And it seems we've landed in a bit of a Delvian soap opera here. Lorana and Hasco used to share unity, but now Lorana is with Colleen and Hasco is jealous. Apparently unity is a sort of mind meld, but also a kind of sex. It's a fusing of mind and body and spirit. And in this week's episode of The Delvians of Our Lives, Colleen wants to share unity with Zod. Not for pleasure, but because Zahn has a skill to share. Zahn seeks John's advice on what to do, and she shows him her backstory. 
Zahn was once a woman in love, in love with a man, Batal, who became a dictator, who brought the peacekeepers to their world and oppressed and enslaved others. She felt she was the only one who could stop him, and so she did. In the midst of unity, she killed him by destroying his mind. The crime I was imprisoned for. And she has spent every cycle of her life since fighting the darkness she unleashed with that act. And now Talene wants Zahn to give her this skill. For the cause, for Delvia, for the greater good. Zahn is torn on what to do, and John doesn't know how to advise her. Eventually, she decides to go through with it. She shares unity with Talene, but Talene isn't satisfied with what Zahn has consented to share. She takes advantage of Zahn and takes her skill and all the mental reserves that Zahn has built to keep herself sane through these cycles. John finds Zahn unstable in anguish at what Talin has done, what she has lost. He tries to be empathetic, but he doesn't quite understand. And he's rather distracted as he's been hallucinating his ex, Alex. Lorena has been messing with his mind on Talin's orders. Preoccupy them all as you would children. Things are not going as well for Talene as she had hoped. Raiding Zahn's brain did not give her that refreshing burst of sanity she was hoping for. Well, maybe killing her father will help. Uh, nope. Well, then maybe she'll just have to convince Zahn to share unity again. On her orders, Hasco is messing with the crew of Moya, while Lorena poses as Alex and rewrites John's memories to include her as his wife here with him the whole time. It's a hell of a mind frell, and somewhere along the line, as he keeps trying to help Zahn, Lorena realizes the harm she's doing and reveals the truth. I release you from what is not true. How in God's name do you call yourself a priest? Zahn has already agreed to share unity with Talene, though she's in a bad state and John sure Zahn wants to kill Talene instead. You were always the most clever one on Moya. With Lorena's advice, he offers himself for unity with Zahn instead. The part of Talene in tonight's unity will be played by John Crichton. While in unity, John gets a glimpse of the demons Zahn fights every day. But he also is able to offer her something. His memory of her the way he sees her. His memory gives her a guide, a way back to herself. With some of her mind back, Zahn confronts Talene in front of her congregation. She tells her this is not the way and leaves her to take her father's place. As they prepare to leave, Zahn chooses to leave her priestly robes behind. She may be a Pau someday, but not now. Seems a shame. Waste all those years of training? Hardly wasted. They were the best cycles of my life. So. Yeah. Folks. Woo. Holy shit. Mm. First of all, that's, Ren, I'm glad that's you're here. My, that's my uh, <laughs> op opening line, Josh. Throw it for you, sir. I was just saying, I'm glad Ren is here uh, for this episode, which is apparently going to split us all into two minds. <laughs> it's okay. We can just share unity, become one mind again. I'm down for it. Man, this episode. <laughs> it's so extra, dude. It's so extra. And like, it's so theatrical too. Like, yeah, I, I felt like I was what I was watching a play at times. It was weird, mm -hmm. but really, really good. So, um, recently you guys have been kind of like, I feel like kind of tough on Zan because, you know, when you watched her in the first few episodes, I think you got this idea of like who you thought she was. And mm -hmm. then, then some things happened and you were like, maybe she's, maybe she's not that good after all. So, I'm wondering how you guys are feeling about her now. Josh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, th I feel like I've been the toughest on her at this point. Uh, I, I'm, I am, in, I really enjoyed this episode because I really enjoyed, uh, I really enjoyed the opportunity to kind of dig into, to 
why the why of Zahn, you know, um, and really kind of unpack a lot of her motivation and, and all that kind of stuff. And and it it was satisfying to me also because I felt like this was a good payoff to um, from her confrontation with with Maldus in the the, the dream chessboard. Uh, to her impulse control issues over the last few episodes, this I feel like was a really good payoff to all of that. Um, so I am delighted with with Zahn in this episode. In all honesty, I'm I'm more or less the same. Although I'm still kind of like pensive in that, like, where is this gonna go? What's gonna happen here? Um, but yeah, I, I love that we got to uh, see her, a bit of her uh, backstory and sort of why she is the the way she is. I, I guess for me, it was just, yeah, thinking she was one thing and finding out that she's kind of something else. And it's like, hmm, I don't know. Yeah, I think the, um, a lot of our expectations often come from trying to compare, sort of trying to do an intertextual thing. We try to... Uh, compare her to the characters we've seen before you know Mm. obviously we compared her initially to um to uh, to diana Diana troy um and then you also compared her to willow (laughs) um and i think there's not a huge number of complex female characters that get to be not good or bad, mm. but just complex. Mm-hmm. And so there, there was a yeah. desire to sort of place her in 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 the mommy role <laughs> because she was being somewhat um maternal. And so there there's a there's a oh well that the the, the this is this is this is the slot she fits in. This is mm-hmm. the mm-hmm. <laughs> but no <laughs> she doesn't I... fit in a box. <laughs> I feel a little better knowing a bit now how she's, why she is the the way she is. Because at first I was getting the vibe that she was just bad for the sake of being bad. You know what I mean? Like a little, like she just enjoyed doing horror, horrible shit to people. But uh, no, she's definitely got, well, from what we've seen, it would appear that she has reasons to being the, the way that she is, as, as most people do, of course. The ability to mess with people's minds would be really like could really mess you up with great you, power you know who she great remind- responsibility <laughs> sorry yes you know who she reminds me of she reminds me of the doctor uh from doctor who see like the ah. doctor has this you know it's like when you meet him on the surface he's just like this nice cool friendly helpful guy wants to take care of the universe and save people but you know it's like there are these layers to him like you know he has this dark backstory of like he was involved in this gigantic war on his home planet and he was forced to do some like horrible war crime things. And he still got some like unexercised rage and trauma and shame over that. And to me, this is that's what Zahn is like. Yeah, I feel like also in this, in this episode, um, we really got a. Uh, I don't know, I, I guess I feel satisfied dramatically like everything that i was hoping would happen with zon's character has happened with zon's character so far um and and there was a little bit of my one of my biggest gripes so far uh, in the show has been how quickly she jumped to to i guess i have to be a sadist when she was fighting yeah yeah um and there was a there was a smidge of that in this episode that like for me like the quickness that she jumped to helping um uh to lean learn how to murder with her mind in the middle of sex, you know, very specific skill set. <laughs> uh, and, and we've all been there. It, sure. <laughs> it comes and goes. Um, but, it, but, you know, her, her doing that in this episode and actually facing the consequences of that impulse and not, not just the consequences of her actions, but the consequences of that impulse that exists within her and grappling with it. That was really satisfying to watch in this episode. This is this is a complicated episode. Um, I I think it could have been executed a bit more ele- elegantly, like in terms mm. of the writing. Like there is a lot of tell um, for the amount of show. Um, this because there's a lot of exposition, and I wonder if maybe it would have been better 
uh, from a writing perspective as a two-parter? Mm, I felt overwhelmed by all the exposition being shoved into my brain. I honestly did. But um, I, st- I, I still look, I, I love the overall design. It was very, very, very pretty. And it was um, very bright. And it was just like, oh, my God, especially the score. The, the score was just off its head and just kept going. Like, it's so extra, like I said before, but I feel like it could have been, been benefited from being dialed back just a little bit. I don't know. Yeah, I feel like there was a lot of stuff packed into this very short episode. Like, you know, there's the whole, we need your uh, mind talent because there's trouble on our home world and, you know, the whole Zan's backstory thing and all the stuff with John and his ex and all the stuff that's going on on Moya. It's like, yo, dog, I heard you like Farscape, so I put Farscape in your Farscape in your Farscape. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great way to put it. Oh, yeah, it will. There's, there's another thing we have to talk about, and it's part of the reason why I, I asked uh, Red to join us, because I felt like I wanted uh, a second queer voice here. Um, because it, it's my turn to go, not like this! Um <laughs> Because I I really love that we have textual, you know, queerness here. We have Mm -hmm. a kind of sex um, that we actually see on screen that Mm -hmm. we see uh, that that we see um, people of the same gender um, engaging in. My lesbadar was definitely pinging. Oh, yeah. (laughs) The problem is that in doing that with, I think, the best of intentions, and also having them be a murderer, they've walked straight, straight into the killer lesbian trope. Uh, straight being the operative word, and and I, yeah. I have a layer, I have a, I have a layer to add to your rage uh, that, I, that I picked up on. <laughs> yeah, because it's it, yeah. I mean, it, it it's like I like it if I can imagine it in a vacuum. It's cool because it's clearly, if you think of it in a vacuum, it's clearly Tallinn is nuts. But what we have textually is a woman who sleeps with women, killing the, you know, violating the consent of a woman she's having sex with, killing someone else, uh, in this case, her father. And then we have the the woman who's having who just had sex with is going nuts and then is saved by having sex with a man yep <laughs> when you put it like that holy shit <laughs> yeah. yeah the whole it is, level it, go, it goes with uh, uh, uh lorena too um hasco yeah. hasco is the one who pulls her back to her morals yeah. Asco and and John, and it, it even says you know treats Asco as the bi or um as Lorena as the bisexual because she did have a relationship with Asco, which again and great she was seduced away uh-huh. to Lor- and yeah yeah and it, like I said in in if you think about it in a vacuum if you hadn't if you didn't know about the Hayes Code and the history of the only way lesbians being represented. This is tragic victims or murderers. Mm-hmm. You very, might not realize. Yeah. It very much falls into the whole predatory lesbian um, subgenre. And actually, I was going to say the whole thing with like Colleen as this like queer female temptress demon archetype, it reminded me of the movie Jennifer's Body. Uh, it's about like oh, this, this oh, young yeah. teenage girl, yeah. Who you guys? I guess you guys are familiar. Yep. Um, yeah, but, but our audience even though, may not yeah. Be. <laughs> well, okay. So basically, Jennifer's Body is this um, low-budget horror movie that came out in 2003, and it stars Megan Fox and Amanda Seyfried. Um, and Megan Fox's character Jennifer uh, is murdered and sacrificed, um, but like there's a complication because she told like the guys who sacrificed her that she was a virgin and she's not actually a virgin. So instead of, you know, the sacrifice going right, her body gets infested with a demon and oh. she feeds on boys. She's like a succubus. Um, but she's also like, she, she even like makes like a cutesy little joke. Like when she's about to murder her female best friend, I go both ways. 
um, that she is like bisexual. Like she and her best friend, who is played by Amanda Seyfried, have this very kind of like lesbian friendship where it's very clear that like Amanda Seyfried's character has a crush on her, even though she's dating a guy. Um, and there's even a part where Jennifer breaks into Amanda's uh, Anita's room and they make out for a bit before, you know, uh, Anita pushes her and is like, what are you doing? You're a murderer. Um, and it, it reminds me a lot of that, that dynamic with uh, Zahn being the Anita character and Talene being the Jennifer character. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I could definitely see that for sure. And, you know, and even the way that they, they framed um because I was suspecting it and then they confirmed it in, in uh, the second to last scene that it wasn't just that Lorena was projecting illusions into John's mind. She was impersonating Alex. Mm-hmm. Um, and when she finally shows up to, to quote unquote, do the right thing, um, she's in this virginal white dress yeah. instead mm-hmm. of in the black clothing that she was in previously. And so like, when you take the the killer lesbian trope and layer it into this this um, spiritual and religious setting that the story is taking place in, and then John even calls him out at the end, and he's like, you know, you call yourself a priest. Um, it 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 is what I like to call a swing and a miss. <laughs> when you know, like what you were saying, Sarah, like not like this. <laughs> yeah, like. Th- in a in a vacuum, it's really good, but mm-hmm. you have if you don't clearly this was made by straight writers who didn't know that there is an entire history of like there's an entire genre of killer lesbian books and killer, mm-hmm. and, and, and I, killer lesbian uh, films. It's yeah. I, I also get yeah. the feeling that like they didn't really understand what they were doing. You know what I mean? Rather than doing it with intent. Um, it seems like they just sort of, you know, you know how, how like um, uh, Joss Whedon says that um, like with the, with, with, with the faith and Buffy, like lesbian sub sub subtext, it mm-hmm. was there, but it just happened. And he's just like, like years later and was like, Oh wow. Like there, there it is. Mm-hmm. That's sort of what it ro- reminds me of kind of. I think they knew that they were having, that they were showing a, a sexual relationship between uh, these women. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's just, you know, straight people don't know a lot about the history of yeah. gay media, you know, it queer media yeah. until recently wasn't, taught so you know you wouldn't know it unless you so unless you sought it out um, you know representation isn't just in casting it also has to be in casting in ways that aren't harmful so the casting has to go with the writing has to go with the directing has to go with mm-hmm. the portrayal you know mm-hmm. like i i can easily imagine that they were like you know and and we'll we'll make the villain a woman because yeah power Right, feminism. Yeah, you know, I can I can imagine that being some substance of the conversation in the writers' room, um, and and maybe a little bit more nuanced than that. But it, without, I guess, without digging into what it means to have the the villainous of the episode also be a seductress mm-hmm. who you know sleeps with women and is just this you know heinous moral myopic person yeah no it it doesn't doesn't remotely help representation i I think that they're they were probably thinking along the lines of her being a mirror for zon i completely agree it's like i said with the you know the 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 costuming mistake in um and um till the blood runs clear it's like i can see a series of decisions Mm -hmm. that led here because they were taken without thinking about without being aware of 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 consequences outside of the yeah, things that that's what i meant by they didn't know what they were uh, doing they just yeah. like they didn't understand the seriousness of what they uh were, were doing i think and they they are they are pantsers you know that uh, right that you know that there's writers who plan and writers who go by the seat of their pants oh okay it's my understanding that most of the the creation of 
Far Escape is very much seat of the pants. And that sometimes leads to greatness and sometimes leads to you missed it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, I, I absolutely think that both Tilly and Lorena were meant to be mirrors of Zahn. Um, you know, Tilleen representing Zahn's darker impulses and, and Lorena representing her her the the pure self that John calls her back to towards the end. But yeah, swing and a miss. I, I have to ask, what is it with this trope in fiction of like women who get too much power and suddenly they're like, let's burn everything. Like, right. you know, with, with Willow and uh, from hmm. Buffy and, uh, you know, uh, Jean Grey and X-Men and Daenerys Targaryen and, you know, Wanda from Marvel. What is that? You never yeah, see this with male characters, except for like maybe Thanos. But even then, it's not like, ah, hmm. I'm so sad and traumatized. I'm going to destroy the world. It's like always like calculated, like, I've had this plan for a long time. I'm going to destroy half the universe. It, you yeah. never see that with women. It's always just like, eh, something traumatic happened to me. I'm going to burn everything. Yeah, uh, my that's... hormones went funny. I had the time of the month. I'm going to destroy the world. Because that's if the main thing. we elect her as president, I, I think... she can start war. <laughs> That's, she might get on her period um, and declare war. Imagine a world. <laughs> that's the main thing that I picked up from Tallinn was just a mad dick, 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 dictator, drunk, drunk on power and wanting more uh, power. And I found that kind of dick dastardly mustache twirling kind of villain, <laughs> like villainy. And I find that a little boring, you know. Um, I felt like. She she was another L, L, L element that was tweaked up to a, to eleven and should have been dialed back just a little bit. Mm-hmm. So, like I think the consensus is there are things we like, hmm. and there are things that bothered us, and we've done a yes. bit about the things that bothered us. So, let's maybe turn it to to the things we liked. Who wants to to maybe talk about uh, Zon's character development in this one? Um. <sighs> I, I'm, 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 I mean, the greatest thing that I loved about Zahn is that scene, that scene, that scene at the end with, uh, with, with uh, John, where they unite. Um, sexual theme, themes aside, I, I can concur with what you, you guys have said. But what I loved about that was that um, it, John helped her essentially by shining a light on the good in her because she could only see like hatred and anger and all 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 this dark shit that that was messing her up and he yeah he showed her 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 light and her beauty and the good she has and that is so freaking precious to me like i i love that so much that that resonated with with me a lot because i've had friends do that for me in the uh, past. I often need a little reminder of who who I am, and that's what John did, and that is precious to me. Um, but in terms of like her her uh, growth, it's as as I said, I love that I finally now have an understanding of why she's this mixed bag of like peaceful Zen, like Mother Earth, and whatever the hell that thing is you know like red eyes and i want to kill everyone and everything <laughs> and do you want to take it from there uh yeah um you know i'm coming at this from a whole you know i've seen the whole show so mm-hmm. i finally finished jack um <laughs> uh but uh yeah no at this point it's like we know that zon did something to end up you know in peacekeeper custody but we don't know what and so it's like, you know, it's finally nice to learn, oh, this is what happened. Um, it, you know, you could probably see that it was probably something like that. I will say, um, as cool as I thought her backstory was, I didn't care for the fact that they, like, linked it to, like, a male love interest that she had. Like, I like the idea of just her, like, being, like, a political dissident, and then that's why she got locked up. But it's like, no, it was also because, like, of a man she knew in her past. Because again, you don't normally see that with men's storylines. I mean, there is the whole thing with Dargo, but um, I just I feel like if she was a male character, that would have that, that wouldn't have played into it. But otherwise, yeah, no, I thought it was. I think it's really cool. And um, like I said, you could kind of see that that was probably what happened with her. You know, with the little hints that they dropped. But it was 
it is finally nice to get there, you know, like, oh, this is what happened. I find it interesting that, that we keep we keep um, coming across this, and I can't remember specifically where, I think it was Rigel's backstory too. We keep coming across this phenomenon where the peacekeepers keep getting invited to planets or in, invited into societies or something like that. Um, and, you know, get all fascisty and murdery and stuff while they're there and totalitarian and whatever, you know, it doesn't go well. Um, but I, that's an interesting pattern that, that has recurred in this episode. Cause that was what, um, she said that Batal did is, is brought in the peacekeepers to help secure his own power. Um, but yeah, no, my God, I just, I, like I said at the beginning, I was just so dramatically satisfied in this episode. It felt like 10 years of sex watching this episode. It was fantastic. <laughs> uh, like my whole living room was just blue the entire time. And I was just like. <laughs> it was like your living room was filled with sunlight. It really was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was great, though. I, I mean, it was it was interesting. And I think they were right to call to lean out on, you know, her, her power hungriness, whatever you want to call it, um, because. Zahn did what she did um, because she felt she had no other option. Talene was looking to weaponize a technique that Zahn, what I make up is that Zahn kind of discovered or invented this ability to murder mid-unity. Um, and Talene was looking to turn it into a, uh, like something that you can teach people and, and make it into a powerful political weapon. Um, and like, that's, that's definitely an overinflation of, you know what Zahn originally intended, but I I, I feel like I, I could go on, um, but someone else should talk for now because I'm just going to go on. <laughs> Do you remember the mad in DNA mad scientist? You know when they meet the guy and he has like the technology that can find people's planets and Dargo, uh, you know, talking about how if I had that technology, I'd use it to you know invade other planets. And Zahn going, mm -hmm. you would use that as a weapon. And I feel like that kind of gets echoed here with, you know, this technique that she's come up with to, you know, kind of calm her dark impulses and somebody taking that and perverting it in a way. Oh, that's a clever observation. I, I, I love that. And it, I think what we, what we learned in this episode, I think um, sheds a new light on, on some of, and a lot of previous interactions with Zahn. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I think we've talked about her before as being kind of the ex-alcoholic mm -hmm. um kind of thing, although ex-killaholic power. <laughs> I think power might be the addiction here. I mean, um, they they literalize the metaphor and she's rolling around on the floor and she goes, It's yeah. intoxicating, John. Yeah, yeah, they've they've definitely hinted at some sort of like kind of like a drug metaphor or substance abuse mm -hmm. metaphor in a way hinted at there there's something about clearly about the way their brains work that you know the power has this effect and that the darkness has this um like a hedon hedonistic glow or something mm -hmm. i'm uh, remembering a certain vampire with a soul who had to lay yeah. off of human blood mm -hmm. <laughs> And there's the Buffy reference to the episode. <laughs> Jack's always keeping track. I think I already said Lesbadar, so. <laughs> uh, there is, so the, the here in the United States, anyway, I don't, I'm not sure what the state of is, is around the world, but um, the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous form the basis for a lot of 12-step recovery groups. Because um, they were kind of the the first ones to come up with with uh, a cohesive system with consistent results, um, and in in the the book of Alcoholics Anonymous, there is a, um, a kind of a tongue in cheek litmus test that they've kind of written in, and they talked about you know if, you, if you're not sure if you're an alcoholic, then by all means go go out to a bar and and you know see how many drinks it takes before you lose control. Um, and I, I've, I've had the, the opportunity to meet people who talk about, you know, well, I'm only, I'm, I, I'm only wild whenever it's wine, 
or, you know, oh, don't give me tequila, then I'll, I'll, I'll go crazy or, you know, some such like that. Um, and for some people that's valid. And for some people that's denial um, and continuing to chase down the specific formula by which one can control the lack of control over uh, a substance or a process is a form of addictive denial. And so that felt like also the metaphor here where Talene was like, well, hang on, no, but like, you know, if we could just figure it out, like, you know, how to make it work, like we can, then we can all, you know, kind of have this thing that you have. The reason that Zahn is so tightly controlled or was before Maldus is because uh, she knows that she can't reach out and lose control at all or, or she'll lose herself as she finally proves to herself in this episode. Yeah, Tarlene's the uh, person that's like, no, you can just have one drink. Just, just one. You'll be mm-hmm. fine. Just have mm-hmm. one drink. The enabler. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love the what Zahn says to her at the end about the precipice. You know, we all come to the precipice at some point or another. You know, you reach down to pull it up and I am trying to hold back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's a fascinating discussion there um so Talene violates her consent mm-hmm. in a sexual act mm-hmm. yep I think we have to talk about that I don't know what to say um then it's just gross and it, it, it makes me feel very uncomfortable but because the way it's done like it's violation in in the sexual act but it's also like the way it's per- portrayed, it's like the closest form of intimacy, you know, like they're sharing like mine, like they literally become one. And so violating somebody and betraying their uh, trust in that act seems so, so gross to me. It's heinous. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, I don't know. Something about it seems like like in in the way beyond what would happen in the real world i don't know how, how, I'm, how i'm explain it because it's like they're literally like it's it's so intimate i don't know it's hard how hard, hard to explain well i, I mean it's, it's further than just sex you know because yeah. like you're in each other's minds you're sharing exactly your soul. yeah although like we wouldn't want to uh downplay the the trauma of Oh, of course not. No, no, no. I'm not doing that. <laughs> no, no, no. At all. no. No, absolutely not. No, but no, yeah, no, no. The, it's I I have known people who engage in BDSM uh you know and kink stuff. And when they have a prescribed, you know, list of do's and don'ts and someone violates that, mm-hmm. it's a different, it's a mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a very it's extra, particular kind it's of it's an extra layer. Yeah. Mm. Extra, yeah, no, I apologize. Layer. I definitely wasn't trying to down downplay anything. It's just it's something about it because um I mean as Rand said, it's like a, a soul thing, and you know, it seems so much more well, well, well not more, but the, it's just very intimate. Yeah. It's so mm. specific of yeah, we're not, trust. Yeah, not to trivialize any form of non- consensual whatever it's just no. it's, it's more like it's heinous in a different way not yeah. like worse or just different yeah. yeah it's a specific flavor yeah and it's uh it's one way of portraying something fiction you know and it fictionally that portrays yeah. a feeling that in of uh the way a trauma can feel in reality the way we, we yeah. even have the the red eyes to illustrate the pain yeah. and the trauma. Mm-hmm. Which I loved that. Um, I don't know if it's a metaphor. It's not a man- metaphor, but I just love that it was a great way to portray that. Um, mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know. I love the use of color and technique and com- composition and all, and all that stuff. Yeah, and all that blue, the red really stands out. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> so much blue. Well, and the, when she when she pops out of her unity with John, um, and her eyes are going back and forth, like that was to me that was really powerful, it was really impactful, mm-hmm. and such a simple effect too. Um, just a little, you know, well, just a little bit of post production color color correction. Yeah. Um, so I, it's it's a it's a heinous act. It's a difficult topic. Um, 
and you know it's it's <clears throat> it's an opportunity for it's an opportunity for adding a layer to zon's atonement uh, and zon's redemption at this point uh, which is i guess a, a, a how i started to look at it um because murder is also a non-consensual act yes you know and and is zon you know keeping such a tight hold on her darkness zon using her advancing powers to protect others like later on when she when she blocks uh Talene trying to brain zap john um and zon you know, putting down the robes and saying, I'm, I'll be a Pau again, maybe someday, uh, is all just, you know, the redemption atonement for a heinous act that she'll never be able to take back. Mm -hmm. And is it possible to justify? I don't feel qualified to answer that question, but she did it and she's living with it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it, it kind of brings up a question of are topics like this, are we trivializing them by portraying them in this kind of like fictional, fantastical way, like through metaphor? And I'm of the opinion that no, I think it's more of a safer way to talk about this kind of thing without potentially traumatizing someone. Like there's some people who would say, you know, Doing this kind of thing in metaphor is trivializing it, but I, I I just don't think so. I think this is it's kind of like you know like the dummy's guide to non-consent. Like you know you look at this and you understand oh what they did was bad, and then you might look at you know a real world example and you go oh this is like that thing, and it might help you better to understand. Yeah, my favorite kind of fiction is the kind of fiction that uses whatever to, to explore real world things, um, whether it's, you know, sci-fi or fantasy, like uh, Buffy, like whatever, like exploration of the real world in through what whatever means. Um, yeah, I think the question, I don't consider it a, a yes or a no answer. I, you know, I. I don't really do bi binaries. I, I like to look at the spectrum. Um, and uh, I think it depends if you treat, you have to treat a difficult subject with care. Mm -hmm. And as much as we love Star Trek, it's a good example of sometimes not treating subjects that should be treated carefully with care because there's mm -hmm. a number of times that Troy's consent is violated in that show mm -hmm. and it's not treated seriously. Um, you know, including like her mind's consent is violated in, in at least one, a couple, at least a couple instances. Um, and uh, yeah, to, to go there and not take it seriously is a bad, is bad. Uh, to try and maybe not get it 100% there is understandable. Um, but to, to, just, to just use it and not, you know, uh, and, and it's never going to be perfect. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this, this episode made some mistakes. We've been clear about that. Um, treating, treating the violation of consent lightly was not one of those mistakes. Um, no, I, I feel it wasn't, um, I agree, but, uh, yeah, the, I mean, we reference Buffy a lot. We know there's one instance there when, although it, when they, um, when they went there and they didn't, I, I think well, we can agree, at least I, I don't think they treated the after effect for Buffy seriously enough. You know, it was the the remorse on Spike was was treated with a great deal of seriousness, but you know, Buffy's trauma was erased. Mm. Um, not and and that's and that's in an ep in an episode where, in an instant where they took it seriously, in like the pack where they didn't take it seriously at all. <laughs> 
and and actually and, happens a lot in that show. So I'm also thinking about uh, it's Ab- Abula Rasa. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in that too. And yeah. very, and also very with up. Faith. Yeah, also with uh, with Faith and Riley. It's mm. like you know he slept with somebody thinking they were one person, and then it turned out to be someone else. Mm. And they acted like, "Oh, you cheated on me." It's like, no, no. <laughs> yeah, there is a serious problem with these things not being treated seriously when it comes to men as victims. Mm. Yeah. You know, and I think tab- tabula rasa is pro- probably the only incident where it's not handled well, but sli- slightly better, I guess. I don't know. There's there's consequences, I guess. I don't know. With this with this episode, when um, I, I I I missed the actual pivot point uh, when Talina, not Talina, Lorena, when Lorena decided to. Uh, stop following Talene's orders and and you know quit impersonating John's ex fiance and that kind of shit. Um, I'm glad that we got there, but I missed I I missed the actual pivot point on screen. Like there was a a, a cut away from Hasco giving her a like come on look, uh, and then you know and the next time that we see Alex, she's in her her confessional white dress. Um, but the the moment at the very end of the episode as John and and Zahn are leaving and John turns to Lorena and says, it's okay. That was Wasn't heavy. earned. Oh, you, you don't think it was earned? I don't feel it was earned. I was I, I just feel like it was heavy and complicated. It's I'm I, I lo- I'd love yeah. to hear your thoughts because I, I think mine are complicated. And may- maybe it's maybe it's just the nature of John that he is very forgiving. Mm-hmm. But it, like when you think about, okay, so if we talk about John's experience of this episode, let's talk about John's experience. Moving <laughs> <laughs> um, on, you know, the, he has been deeply, deeply missing his home, mm-hmm. um, and the idea she gave him. Uh, the illusion of not being alone, not being the only human, and of this person he loved being with him and the whole thing. And she was like, gaslighting doesn't even begin to cover how the level of manipulation right? that she was it doing. Was fuck. It's yeah. like top tier manipulation. Like, holy fuck. And then, I mean, yes, if he wants to be to, to give her grace and offer her, it's it's all okay. Then yeah, but it it felt like oh boy, is he you know forgiving a lot? <laughs> because yeah, that I feel like there probably just wasn't enough time for you know to deal with him and the repercussions of feeling of of having that feeling of that you know you have this piece of home with you and mm-hmm. then in the next second it's gone again. Um, I feel like, you know, again, there's too much Farscape in this Farscape. Um, but I feel like John also looked at Lorena and, you know, he he realized that she, too, is a victim. Like, she was manipulated by Tallinn. And that, while that certainly mm-hmm. is not an excuse for her actions, I think maybe it made him see her with a little bit of empathy and go, I'm going to let it slide. And I think yeah. the the fact that she does do the right thing in the end accounts for something. It doesn't excuse what she uh, did, but it 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 means something. I think. So I think that's why. Um, I guess it it. I guess emotionally it feels unearned, but dramatically it doesn't. If that makes sense, if, if I can split mm-hmm. that particular hair, um, it feels like. Like grace, I think is a perfect word for it. Unearned forgiveness. John gave her grace, and and I, and I was you took the words out of my mouth, friend. Like L- Lorena was also, everybody was a victim of of Talene in this episode. Like she was she was a cult leader, mm-hmm. you know. She was a, um, and they were all living in their in their you know their their little commune out in the middle of a of a of nowhere on this planet. You know, it was isolating, and it was and. Yeah, so unearned forgiveness emotionally, absolutely. Unearned forgiveness dramatically, I don't think so. I think that that John's forgiving nature and Lorena's 
status as uh, also a victim, I think is really what, what made it work for me. It was heavy. It was weighty. It, and, and I don't even know if I could have made the same um, decision in John's place, but like it, it, oh, it was big. I think maybe, a, I think maybe a smaller gesture would, would have been more, would have felt more realistic to me. Like him saying, I'll let it slide. Rather than the whole, like him sort of giving her a benediction at the end, that <laughs> the, the the level of it felt like <laughs> <laughs> like oh okay we're gonna we're gonna let all of this go, but then maybe that's me also just feeling protective of John because who oh, why are they being so mean to our boy? Mm. <laughs> Josh, it's um it sounds like you're uh, trying to say that to forgive is an act of com- compassion. <laughs> That is exactly what I was thinking about, Jack. Exactly. <laughs> the thing about abuse is that a lot of times it breeds more abuse. And, mm-hmm. you know, eventually somebody has to say, no, the buck stops here. Mm-hmm. I'm not I'm not passing that on to someone else. I'm not going to seek retribution. It's like it ends with me. Mm. Letting, yeah, letting go of the need to pay back harm is is very difficult um and is also a lot of times essential for yeah. anybody to be able to move on you know yeah i think i just maybe either to have john say something like you know, to, to have john sort of talk about it as i'm doing i, I want to break the cycle or, or something it, i don't know it just there was something about him just be just doing the the sort of blessing for her that just it didn't feel fully earned i can honestly see where both of you are coming coming from it's not, it's not, a little not that more I'm trying to sit, sit on the uh, fence but so. <laughs> it, no, it, no. yeah it's a little more on the there may be too much far escape in this far escape maybe this should have been a two-part yeah, well, I, it, it's also a, a supremely in my opinion, it was a pretty nuanced episode. I mean that that we can mm. that we can slice this pie so many different ways. To me, is a testament to the episode. The mm. thing is, I did like this episode a lot, but it really was so much Farscape in Farscape, and and so I struggled with it a little bit because of that. Just trying to absorb everything. I feel like I need need to watch it three three or four more more times and then re- record this pop podcast again because like. My notes, I've got about like probably like 20% less than, than I use, usually do. It's just because there, there was just this onslaught of everything come, coming at, at, at me. So I got a little over, overwhelmed kind of. Yeah, this is my second time seeing this episode. And I feel like I understood it way better this time than I did the first time I watched it. I was definitely watching it like this most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> I've watched it a couple times and I still I still cannot tell you where the where the point is that 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 uh oh what's her name L- Lorena I keep my brain keeps saying her Lorena Bo- and then going to Bob it which is not not <laughs> <laughs> not who she is but uh I I still can't tell you where Lorena uh changes her you know where where the switch flips and she makes a dif- different decision, you know, no matter how many um, times I've seen this episode. I think um, there, I do vaguely recall a scene where she kind of like questions Talene and Tal- Talene's just like, no, we're doing this or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I vaguely recall something like that. I think there there is the moment where Hasco, where she tells them to to play with their minds like children. And Hasco says, is that how you would tr- treat your children? Yeah, um, um, but it. I still don't think that's the moment. It, it's just like there's these. There's it, com- it comes later. Yeah, there. There's sort of like we we don't see the straw that breaks the camel's back. Mm-hmm. There's um. So there there's a kernel of, I guess, thread that ties um John and Zon together. <laughs> John and Zon uh, ties them together in this episode, and that's that's how how the people who love us see us, Um, you know, and that's, that's the thing that almost lets John break through the illusion um, of of Alex, because Alex keeps advocating against John's compassionate nature. 
mm-hmm. um, and keeps advocating for uh, an inauthentic version of himself. And and you know, so John kind of learns that that lesson from the illusion and takes it into to help Zahn and, and advocates for the best version of herself for her for her authentic self uh, rather than the 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 monster she's afraid she is. Um, but it was it. I almost wish that he had broken through the illusion instead of gotten, you know, instead of them having to break it for him. Hmm. Uh, yeah. Cause I think that would have had a little bit more dramatic heft to it um, in a not quite so cheesy way. I'm not a big fan of, uh, and this feels like a flavor of it. I'm not a big fan of mind control and storytelling because I feel like it has a very specific uh, if then formula. Uh, mm-hmm. where the only person who can resist it obviously is going to be our hero because they're just the paragon of, of virtue and whateverness. Or, um, you know, if it's a mechanical device of some sort, then it doesn't make any sense that anybody could resist it and the story's over in act two. Hmm. You know, Why? I, it's to me, it's a cheat and I'm not a fan of it. But I've... I would have actually enjoyed it if John had broken uh, through the illusion in this episode, you know? And, yeah, and um... Maybe that makes me... Maybe that makes me a, a, a Pau hypocrite. <laughs> I really loved I love the um, I never gave you that scene with the with the yes. rings. That's and that's yes. where I thought that's what I thought was gonna gonna happen. I thought him was gonna break through the uh, spell or whatever then. Mm-hmm. And the fact that he didn't, I guess it's kind of subversive, but yeah, I don't know. Um I also speak speak of John, I kind of rolled my eyes a little bit when it appeared as though he was like they were they were setting him up to save the day yet again lone ranger sa- saves everybody um but then i changed my mind a bit with that ending because that's that so, my heart my freaking heart <laughs> i'm still trying to understand if there was like symbolism with like the tree roots like you know like the, the- mm old man tells john don't touch the tree roots it's toxic and then later on and then you know at the end of the episode he's chopping them I was, i'm trying to understand if there's like symbolism there i feel like it's like you know on the tip of my tongue i'm just not getting it well i think there's something there about the you know toxic things which appear toxic and aren't and things which appear nice and you know there there's layers yeah. of, of that because there's a lot that's toxic here and a lot that's um appearances not being what they are right i think there's also mm. a little bit to the number of times that people kept saying reaching down for my darker impulses mm. um but which roots are below um and john chopping them at the end after he you know shows zon or, or helps zon see her true self her authentic self there's something to that he didn't chop all the way through the root though he just kind of stopped three quarters of the way through and that threw me off well, whatever he did was enough to make the whole thing shake. Sure. From beneath you, it devours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and he's t- tending a uh, t- tending a, an orchard of orchard of dead trees. I don't know. There's something symbolic there, but again, yeah. I think there's too much in this one. <laughs> so there's something symbolic there with the the recovering alcoholic metaphor um, that that also ties to Zahn's final scene. Uh, and it's very like if nothing we do matters and all that matters is what we do you know like it um it's it's been it's been my experience since the education that i've received that that any addict who declares themselves cured for all time uh, is probably wrong um you know that that it's there's it's a there's a phrase in in a lot of the 12 step groups one day at a time mm-hmm. um and so even if the tree roots are, even if the trees are dead, tending to dead trees isn't necessarily a, a futile act if it helps the person doing the tending, you know? And then at the end, Zahn putting down the thing and saying, you know, we, we what, how does she put it? Uh, our experiences today infuse our, tom- our knowledge tomorrow or something like that. And she talks about maybe I'll be a pile again, but, you know, not, not today. That's her starting her, her that's her starting her her uh, addiction recovery on day one was her putting down the robes and walking out. You might say that John and Zahn really uprooted their temple. <laughs> this is why you're here. <laughs> um 
Speaking of theme and sim- symbolism, I was trying to come up with a clear theme um, surrounding all the illusions that the the crew have shown. Um, mm. and, and all I could really come up with was that, that they are shown things that the Delvians believe to be their weaknesses, except I don't know how well that fits because Aaron and Rigel seem to be shown things that they fear. Um, whereas Crichton is shown uh, the woman that he loves and Dargo is shown his long lost son. So I don't know. What well, did you guys pick up? Let's think about this. We've got uh, Aaron, it, the, the one who has been trying to learn to do things other than just be an infantry person, mm-hmm. uh, sees a gun falling apart that she doesn't know how to put back together. Okay, yeah. Her. Not to mention, you know, she's very well established at being someone who's afraid of showing weakness and vulnerability and, you know, not having a working weapon makes you vulnerable. Right. I yeah. think for me, the most interesting one was Rigel because, I mean, with John and Dargo, it's kind of obvious, like, John misses Earth, Dargo wants to find his son again. With mm-hmm. Rigel, though, it's like they just show him shrinking, which, you know, it's like on the surface level, it's like, what? What does that have to do with anything? But I think it's actually very telling because, you know, Rigel, for all his bravado, I think he's a very insecure character. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And the fact that he is like, you know, has been reduced by having his power taken from him and the fact that he is literally smaller than everyone mm-hmm. else on Moya, I think that has impacted his ego a lot. So, you know, he's, you know, he has this vision of himself shrinking and like almost being stepped on by everyone. Like, right. it's got to be terrifying to be on on a ship when you're that size and mm. everyone around you is humongous. Even if you do have a little floaty chair to get around in, it's like if you didn't have the chair, then he would mm. constantly be underfoot. Yeah. So I think, I think that's very interesting insight to who he is, and his insecurities. Right. So it is, I guess, uh, perceived weaknesses and fear, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And Dargo yeah. Feel, fears never finding his son. Yeah. I just felt like, like emotionally, everything sort of felt different because John's all love me, Dovey, and his girlfriend's there, and he loves it. And um, Aaron's just like kind of confused, and then Dargo's all like run, running around the ship, trying trying to fight, fight his son. I don't know; it just seemed well, a little they, they all, disconnected. They all definitely suffered from there being not enough oh, yeah. room. Yeah, um, even their <laughs> like even the performances were a little bit more goofy. Um, even Dargo's, in my opinion, was a little, was a little goofy when he was running around going, Jothy, Jothy, where are you, boy? Yeah. Um, However, there is something kind of sad about the fact that Dargo's whole thing is that he keeps running after Jothy and Jothy keeps like darting out of the room. Like yeah. it's, it portrays a fear that by the time he finally finds Jothy, that Jothy won't want to see him. Jothy won't want any involvement with him, like that he's ashamed of him for, you know, what he's been accused of and. Mm-hmm. Uh, all, you know that all the time he's been in prison that's really sad it's yeah again it, it it's it's all in the fact that this episode just had too much farscape and it's farscape there wasn't enough time for everyone something just clicked yeah. for me mm-hmm. um, what I, so i and while i was watching the episode i found it interesting that pilot was unaffected um yeah when yeah. When, they were, when they were when they were broadcasting their their you know confusion illusions um but you know he calls john and he goes they're all behaving rather strangely, you know, and, and, you know, it's just kind of like doing his, doing his usual thing. Um, but then I was thinking, well, maybe pilot's brain just works differently. And then I was thinking pilot is also, you know, deeply entwined with Moya at this point. And then I was thinking that it's a form of unity. Mm. Pilot ah, and pilot yes. and Moya, pilot and Moya are, have a form of, of unity that, that gives them strength. That's wonderful, and that that lets them that lets at the very least pilot you know resist or dodge this attack, and and that's what saves Zahn at the end is is her unity with John and the people who you know see the best in her. Mm-hmm. So that, that just clicked for me while we, while while you were talking, Ren. And as much as John, son of a bitch, <laughs> <laughs> and and as much as John was was lovey dovey with Alex, I think emotionally what it is was he was imagining having a piece of home with him. Yeah, right. Not being the only human. Yeah. And not being alone. Yeah. I did think uh, it was kind of funny, though, that, like, you know, whenever we saw Alex with John, 
in the temple, he almost seemed kind of like annoyed with her. Like, mm -hmm. leave me alone. I'm trying to get stuff done. And you're over here nagging me about our relationship, which makes you wonder just, just how happy were John and Alex? Like, you know, we saw the <laughs> dream at the beginning of the episode and they were all lovey dovey bed and stuff. And, and, you know, it's like he was going to propose to her, but I don't know, maybe he's harboring some kind of like, resentment toward her for taking the job that she took and leaving him and maybe well, that's sure, why he sure acts he all dismissive toward her and then besides this isn't actually alex this is like a projection yeah. based on his memory of her well and his memory of her is, is, might be dominated by their breakup so so yeah i i actually read that as him not being completely sucked in by the illusion knowing that mm -hmm. there's something not quite right uh, same. Um, that's what I got too. Yeah. I also found it interesting the way that she told him that she got the job. Uh, she said, I took the Stanford job as though they had discussed a job offer she had previously and had discussed a break previously and had discussed a continent mm -hmm. between them previously. Um, and the decision to propose marriage while someone is in the middle of deciding whether or not to leave uh, he is a is a little yeah it's a little um not actually about proposing marriage it's about <laughs> yeah somebody yeah yeah possession anyway mm -hmm. while we're on the subject of deep meaningful things and delving into stuff Do Aaron. delving Delving, huh? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> you're you're ruining my my setup. I'm been, sorry. Well, Delving. <laughs> we're delving. Well, while we're well, we're well, we're looking at all the deeply symbolic, at all these these moments. Anybody got any thoughts on Aaron wearing John's underwear? Oh my lord! <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> the Calvin, the Calvin Klein joke. I'm like, they stole that fruit from Back to the Future. They that totally is straight stole from Back to the Future. The future. <laughs> I'm surprised John wonder, didn't if, point to that out. Yeah. <laughs> I have to wonder: is there like a laundry room on Moya? That's what I was <laughs> saying. They all do their laundry <laughs> in like one machine, so that's how it gets mixed up. And Aaron was like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I was, I just, my thought was, how did this happen? Why? Like, I don't understand. There was no, she just wore his underwear for no reason. Maybe they're more comfortable than the Peacekeeper ones. Oh, Men's sure. Underwear. Men's underwear sure, that's what I'm assuming. But I'm, but, but I'm just like, what, did she just find them? And just thought, oh, yeah, these will do. Like, I, I don't understand the mechanics of that. Well, clearly there is somewhere that they're doing laundry. <laughs> But she also, I wonder. I wonder if that'll appear in an episode at some point or not. I, I got to I got to imagine also though that uh, it's he's the, he his underwear the only other underwear on the ship that she probably could fit into. Mm. Yeah, she's not gonna fit into Dargos. Or I'm, I'm, I'm not doing Dargos <laughs> tiny whiteies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or, or pilots. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow. It's just like something that you would see Morticia Adams knitting on the Adams family. She's oh like, my. A, like a pair of underwear with like yeah. four the mental five, images. And, and you <laughs> know that Zahn does not wear underwear. Zahn does not Absolutely wear underwear. Not. No. Like she also She's pretty blue in it. Her robe. She yeah. was just wearing a sheet in one scene, right? It looked like a, yes. a, a sarong or something. Yep. <laughs> yep. I mean, um, you've got to put something on to go to the bridge. She, she, there's no way. <laughs> she probably sleeps nude. But she, li she lives. Yeah. Ready to go. Nudity taboos. And I'm yeah, sorry, but there is no way that they weren't like. So, like last episode, Aaron and John this close, this this close, and then. In the next episode, Aaron is literally in his, his pants. I'm sorry, that is not. That's that's a little on the nose, and I kind of love it. But that that is not an accident. That 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 is absolutely a. It was the kind first of a thought I had. Joke. Mm. <laughs> Josh, it looks like you have some something to say. No, you just you reminded me of last episode and and how how much I lost my shit. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, did you expect that in this next episode he would be having sex with Zon? <laughs> Mind sex, but. I they, like uh, Talene even said, like you know, like your feelings for Zahn or something. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, w I'm sorry, his feelings for who now? 
You know what, guys? Moya I was just... right all along. Everybody just wants you to were. bang everybody else. Moya Nobody ever disagreed with you on that one. <laughs> Moya is just one big polycule. That's all it is. Yeah. <laughs> that was great. Just a big cuddle like pile. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. No, I, I think there's... Sorry, you said this before. I think there's different kinds of love also. And I think that your feelings for Zahn, you know, deep, deep, meaningful love doesn't necessarily have to be sexual. No. Uh, it's great. And it's a bonus when it is. But, you know, your I think, feelings. I think John, I think John and Zahn are in the camp of we're just friends. But if you ask, I mean, I'd be dead. <laughs> there, I mean, there's a lot of unconditional support there. Right? You know, mm -hmm. Zahn was the first one to reach out and make John feel welcomed on Moya. Zahn saved John from Maldus. Uh, you know, and, and you know, in a lot of ways, what he, he, Zahn was the first one to believe John that he was uh, looping in time and all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of in, from John to Zahn, a lot of like unconditional support. And sex doesn't have to lead to a relationship. Yeah, don't they literally wake up next to each other and Zahn's like naked in that um, that episode with the with the root? Um, mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I forget what it's called. Pretty much. Thank God, yeah. thank God it's Friday again. Tomorrow's rest. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. So. In which she was all, she was also to going everybody. to accept uh, uh, Dargo's proposals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, if yeah. See. Yeah. They all just want to get it on, and I don't blame them. All all the power to them. <laughs> If we're not going to space to fuck the aliens, then what is the point? <laughs> What's the point? <laughs> so there we go. John are in this story. This is the first instance of human fucks alien. Human fucks. Yes. And I'm sure it's about to get a whole lot fuckier because Muppet sex mm. and trauma, friends. <laughs> not fuckier. <laughs> in, in more ways than one. Oh, no. <laughs> And that's probably about time that we should uh, be thinking about favorite parts. Well, yeah. speaking of fucks. <laughs> <laughs> I think I made it very, very clear. My favorite part is uh, John helping Zahn by shining a light on her uh, goodness and all the good things in, in her. That moment, I think, res resonated with me more than anything else in, in the show up to, to this point. Same. I am a simple person with simple pleasures. For me, my favorite part was Aaron in John's underwear. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just liked it. Like me a, like me a pretty gal in white cotton underwear. Yeah. Mm. Same. Yeah. That's fair. <laughs> I think all that's right. one page we're all on the same page with. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I, uh, I got to go with the majority. I was trying to think of something else, but yeah, that. The gift of giving her the yeah. insight of, yeah, because I have I have had moments when my friends and in, including you, including you guys, um, sort of gave me the the gift of of you know showing me how you see me, uh, and that uh, you're reflected in the pe people around you. <laughs> you are, and um, that is uh, a path to find your way back to to your own mental health journey i think mm -hmm. nobody can walk it for you uh Oof. but giving you you know the way to find your your way back is uh is a thing we can do for one another and uh and when we do it's beautiful oh I have so many <laughs> feelings right right now. Aw. That was beautiful, Sarah. Internet hugs. Yeah. yeah. I love you, you guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So with that, uh, that oh so much love, uh, how can people get a hold of you? Uh, let's start uh, with our guest, Ren. Yes. Right. So I am Ren the Barbarian. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram. Uh, YouTube, of course, and uh, TikTok under Ren the Barbarian. Uh, I make cool, I make videos about Star Trek. I just put out one recently about uh, Star Trek TOS, and sometimes I do other video essays. Uh, so, yeah, come and check me out. Good content. 
Phenomenon. <laughs> Jack hasn't seen it yet. <laughs> no, but I know him the tune, so I can I can bump bump along. <laughs> and you, baby, where can people find you? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at lack of surprise one. That's all one word with the number one at the end. Uh, you can find me um where else? Um uh 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 well, um, oh, um, so I, I, you can uh, catch me on an, another podcast I do with my friend Ian Martin from Passion of the Nerd called Podcast of the Nerds. We're on a bit, bit of a hiatus at the moment, but if you want to go and check that, that out on you, 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 YouTube, you can. Uh, you can find me on Instagram. Um, that's just at Jet Jack Cram or one, one word. And uh, you can check out my work with Chipperish Media on the Endless po- Podcast and the now finished, still pretty uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer po- podcast. Josh, where can we find you, sir? Just come on over and hang out with me on Instagram at Josh Gosden. Um, I cook things. I talk about self care. I cook things while I talk about self care. Uh, so just come on and, and join me over there. Just come on in. That's Josh needs to do ASMR. Oh, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm sorry, as that you can find me at the Costume Codex on YouTube or on Twitter um, at uh, Blue Stock in Sara. And you can find all of us at our Discord, um, which the the link to which will be in the doobly doo, or you can find us off on Twitter at uh, MuppetsXNT1. And you can find us in two weeks back here talking about the episode Jeremiah Crichton. Now, Ooh. does anyone have any suggestions on what might be coming up on Jeremiah Crichton? Biblical thing. Something bi- biblical is my my, my guess. Bullfrog. John gets turned into a bullfrog. <laughs> That's what I was going to say. <laughs> <laughs> bullfrog. Rin and, Iron brains. Rin and Iron Unity. A Muppet frog, baby? <laughs> will, will we have a, a Kermit cameo? Kermit the frog? Oh, Kermit cameo confirmed. <laughs> Honestly, I, mean, yeah, I, I wish. I mean, trauma. That's where the Muppets come from. I, right? I, I wish we, we had a Kermit. <laughs> Finally, Josh, we figured it out. <laughs> and following that will be the episode Durka Returns. Do you guys have any thoughts on that one? Oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, what Josh said. <laughs> And you know what's coming, but do you want to make any uh, deliberate missed leads on what's coming up under Gritters? <laughs> any wrong uh, answers for me? Wrong answers. So, so Durka has to do his, his tax returns. Uh, ah. with the IRS. <laughs> Durka returns. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to say Bat- Batman shows up for no re- reason whatsoever. Cool. Okay. So that's all from us. Come back in two weeks. Thanks, friends. Bye, y'all. Love y'all. Do ba dee ba da do dee 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 dee. And blue da ba dee ba da 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 ba dee. We ready to go? Mm-hmm. Let's do it. Engage. Sorry, Josh, I stole your line. No, you're good. Okay. You're, we're in unity. Okay. <laughs> oh, my. Uh-huh. Josh, I would tone, tonally unite with, with you, like, totally. <laughs>